In studio is Constant Cap. He is the executive director of the Kilimani Project Foundation. Constant, thanks for coming in. Um, of course, a lot of chatter now from Nairobians in terms of, okay, there's the political issues happening at City Hall, but when it comes to service delivery, there's a lot of questions that come up. Uh, and at the base of all of this is the issue of urban planning, which really has been with Nairobi for decades when you think about it. Um, but in terms of what we've been dealing with as a city, now as a county, um, you have experts saying that it's been 66 years of unplanned growth in Nairobi, what have been the implications of something like that? Okay, I would not call it 66 years of unplanned growth. Um, I would go back to the historical aspects of the city and I would look at it from planned growth but in a skewed manner. Okay. Because when we go back, say, to the 40s, uh, the plan of 1948, the plan of a settler, a settler city, that was clearly a plan made towards having a, a divided city along along racial lines. Right. We had that's where we have the European zone the Asian zone and the African zone, which uh, is now Eastlands, Asian zone, mainly parklands, uh, parts of Nairobi West, and then uh, what we call upmarket areas now, mm -hmm. being the European zone. After that, these areas turned into more of uh, economic divisions, you know. Um, the left, uh, the middle class will stay in a certain area, the, the richer people, perceived richer people or richer people will stay in a certain area, and right. the poorer will stay in another area. And then an interesting angle comes in because there's, uh, there's never been planning for informality. Hmm. So amidst those divisions, then you have this influx of people coming into the city um, from 1963, um, seeking jobs, looking for better life. Um, and, this, and from there we began having what we call the informal settlements, uh, settlements right. you know, what, uh, which is uh, the polite way of calling it. Other people call them slums. And planning has never actually looked into how we can, how to handle some of these in, in, in formal settlements. After that, we had a plan of 1973, mm -hmm. uh, which was the urban, urban, Nairobi Urban Study Group. And what, what is interesting is that I came to know that the, the plan was never approved. So in, in effect, it was never really used. Mm -hmm. And from uh, those who are involved in the plan, uh, formulating the plan, um, who have had the honor of meeting, I've had the honor of meeting some of them. Mm -hmm. They told me that that was actually a very visionary plan that would take us up to the year 2000. Mm -hmm. But without the application of that, of course now you end up, we ended up with all sorts of uh, land use management, um, what we would say uncontrolled land use management, right. and then we end up with subsequent problems. Right. Um, planning is also involves a lot of social cultural aspects, and these have to be integrated. And if you don't take into account some of these, you end up now having a, a, a what we may, we may call a domino effect right. of, of, of further, further challenges within, within the city. And that's how we see now the development of informality. We see the impact of, uh, say, mismanagement and corruption having a first, I mean, we've all experienced it firsthand. We've seen the, we saw the gentleman talking about cartels mm. earlier on. So you also have that aspect. And together with that social cultural aspect, I also like to bring in the, the fact that what we have now, the Nairobi we have now, the, the person you have in Nairobi now is a bit different from the person we had, say, in the 60s or the 70s, with all due respect to those, the people then. Because now we have a generation of people who are born and raised in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And these people, including me, we feel that this is our home and we feel the bigger part that we have to have a say in, in how this is done, right. in how the city uh, develops in how the city is planned. So you have, we, we, we also had a problem of too much top-bottom planning, where everything is done from the, the central point, be it uh, Ministry of Local Government, be it City Hall, and then is imposed on, on, on the citizens. Right. Fortunately, now what we are seeing is more community-based invol involvement, which is where even people like me come through the Kilimani Project Foundation. Yeah. We have successful stories from uh, um, South Sea Residents Association. We have a group known as South in Nairobi that has brought different stakeholders together to voice for better service delivery, better urban management. So that involve, more involvement by the common person mm. is what can bring about better, actually better service delivery and planning. Because now they are, you're planning for people. Right. If you're planning, you're not coming and telling them that this is what the city will be, which is a bit of a colonial way, approach towards 
doing things. So do you think that whole citizen-led approach will help remedy a lot of the issues that we're seeing? Like you mentioned before, it was people coming from the rural areas to the city looking for a better life. Now you have the influx of people born in Nairobi uh, populating. And then you're seeing the issue of the sprawling satellite towns outside. Yeah. So people leaving Nairobi because it's too expensive to settle and creating their own communities out there. What is that doing even in terms of urban planning? Because you're seeing them sprawling up really with no plan or management of land. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because at one point the, the planning laws required that planning of urban areas in uh, urban designated areas, the urban authority, like say the city council, also had a designation of a certain number of kilometers right outside the city. Mm -hmm. But this was never planned. And you see that happening now in uh, just at the what I would say the border border areas, yeah. you know, you have, like you mentioned, Rongai, Idurai, Kino, such such areas. But sprawl also tends to be an effect of, of other challenges, mm. like poor land use management within, within the city, where you underutilize your land within the city and people end up moving out, where you don't have proper, uh, say, human settlement programs within the city. We've got, we still have a lot of space, for instance, within the city. And uh, the previous governor had tried to initiate uh, urban renewal program yeah. that unfortunately was not done in a very inclusive manner and the people actually ended up fighting against it. Because there's a lot of city county owned land that can be used for good, well established human settlements so as to densify the city as much. Mm. Uh, we had the fortune, uh, we were quite fortunate in Kilimani Project Foundation of having a meeting with the uh, um, de former, almost to be former <laughs> deputy governor. Yeah. And this is one of the things he actually discussed with us that the city still needs to densify a lot more but in a planned way. And we as planners are there to actually help the authorities come up with this. Because we, do not, we don't want a situation where it takes people three hours to get to work. Either because you're in traffic within the city mm -hmm. or because you're traveling from Naivasha. Okay, talking a bit radically, but <laughs> you're traveling from Naivasha to, to come to the CBD. Yeah. So we need to look at land use management within the city. How can we have, um, in planning we're moving away from traditional zoning of areas. We're looking at what we call transit-oriented development, mm -hmm. which is developing cities such that we have more densified areas closer to means of mass transit. For example, uh, light rail systems, mm -hmm. um, bus rapid uh, transit systems, where we have leeways for uh, mobility and, and, and transit that enable people to access one part of the city to another right. in an adequate means. And we have more denser developments there so that we don't have people going deep into neighborhoods um, in a, more dif in, in a more difficult manner, Bas yeah. basically to easen the movement of people with, within the city. And some cities have succeeded. Mm. Um, there's, there's a very nice story from Bogota. I would advise even Kenyans to go to YouTube and just look for urban planning in Bogota yeah. Yeah. on how they developed a mass uh, rapid system, uh, transit system. And they came up from a background like ours. Okay, you're a third world developing mm -hmm. country. You've got uh, so-called cartels running your transit industry, your land use management. But you take a human-oriented approach. And, and here we, we're moving a bit into mobility from land use, but yeah. we're talking of having a more human-oriented approach where the person is a priority over the car. So when you, you're talking of moving people from one part of the city to another, you're talking of using non-motorized transit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. walkways, uh, cycling, right. safe cycling ways, not just putting a painting across the road and saying, this is a cycle way. No, yeah. if it's a Has cycle way, where, yeah, if it's a cycle lane where your five-year-old child cannot cycle, mm. that is not a cycle, and mm. it's dangerous for everyone. But basically, you see what where I'm saying, putting it uh, pro-human uh, um, actions, right. yeah, prevail, and this also helps the masses, because let's face it, 60 percent of Nairobians uh, use non-motorized means, uh, come from the informal settlements. Right. We have over 200 registered informal settlements within Nairobi. Yeah. Okay. The priori our priority should be how do we take care of planning for these people. And sometimes when you prioritize for them, it, it spills over. It spills over. When you put non-motorized means of transit or good, uh, take care of the urban economy for these people, crime rates go down, you have easy mobility, you have uh, faster, better service delivery. So you're able to deliver much more to, right. to, to the people of, of Nairobi. You mentioned the whole issue of uh, these informal settlements, which you know, it's something that is a reality, especially here in Nairobi. In your view, what could be the remedy to that? We saw the slum upgrade uh, project, and I also want to get your take on that, what you thought about it. But in terms of a short-term uh, solution to that, 
what in your view could work? I think first of all involving them in replanning of their areas. Um, I've met people who are involved in doing public spaces in uh, some of the informal mm -hmm. settlements that has helped also create spaces for children to play, make them feel more inclusive, delivering uh, key services to them like education, uh, water, uh, garbage collection. Because um, unfortunately informal settlements are not a housing problem like we tend to look mm -hmm. at it. Okay, which kind of answers <laughs> the question you've asked. It's, yeah. not, it's, it's, it's almost a bigger urban economy problem. Many European cities developed because uh, people were moving in during the Industrial Revolution. So they were going to jobs that, that were available. And they were able to kind of fast track some of these challenges that we're we seeing here. Whereas for us, it's different because people are coming into the city mm -hmm. to look for jobs that, are, that may not be in existence. So right. priority should be to take, to see what are the best uh, services. How can we make their standards of living better. We may not be able to build for them better housing because that may not be the immediate problem. Mm. Many of them will end up renting out those houses and moving and forming a settlement elsewhere, which is what we've, we've seen happening. Mm. That was the, what happened to Nyayo High Rise. We've seen that happening in some of the other um, so-called slum, they call them slum upgrading projects. Right, right. Um, but if we, for instance, provide education, quality education to the children in informal settlements, you're able to have a long-term longer term solution towards some of these vocational training to some of the youth in these in these areas and we we have some people who are trying it in in different uh, informal settlements i've seen a group in eastland who was starting a co technology college just to focus on this kind of vocational training teaching them mechanics teaching them carpentry teaching you know teaching them welding skills things that will that are skills that have almost disappeared I mean, when this, today when you look for a plumber, it's difficult to get a very good plumber. Mm. But I, I, I mean, you, you get what I'm saying. Yep. We give them those quality health care, okay? quality health care within those settlements. We're able to also give, make them feel more, the people there feel more wanted, right. and then involve them in some of these planning. Mm. Mm. One of the worst things that, uh, that has happened over the years in planning is a very top-bottom approach, where you plan for people, and then they don't accept. Today there was a newspaper cutting someone sent me of, I think it's in Homer Bay, of a, a dam that has been built mm -hmm. that was to be used for irrigation. People are using it for washing clothes. So when you don't <laughs> involve the communities right. in, in their planning, and this goes across from, we've talked a bit about informal settlements, yep. also in the middle class neighborhoods. Okay? I know many middle class neighborhoods that are begging for open spaces, for, you know, just to place for their children yeah. to play, especially the more densifying areas. So involving these community organizations, residents associations that are becoming more and more powerful in, in uh, vocal, in, maybe not powerful, but vocal mm. in the city, involving them in the, in the planning, just like some of the people said from that uh, clip you, right. you, you, at uh, Jivanji Gardens, they should ask us. And I've, we've seen some effort by the county government involving people in the CIDP. We had a couple of meetings uh, all over the city last year. We've seen uh, people going to City Hall with uh, various complaints. Mm -hmm. We had a very sad story, I think, two years ago where we had floods in um, South Sea, you may remember, and yes. there was a school bus that was stuck overnight. Right. Uh, together with some friends, we went to see the then um, roads minister of, of the city, and that particular road was raised two levels higher, drainage improved. So more involvement from the people mm. does have a, 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 bigger, a bigger effect. Because we as planners, we are, we are happier planning with the people than planning for the people. Right. We do have some areas of expertise, and that is true. But solutions tend to come from, from the bottom. I mean, if I can come and talk about uh, urban aerial uh, cable transit in, in, in cities, you may not find too many people who have too much knowledge about that. But when we share it with the people and then they give us their views, we can get even more um, ideas. And they also right. feel that they're part of it. And let's talk about flooding, because you mentioned the whole South Sea scenario, which uh, a lot of people are wondering, why do we keep having this problem? Even with new construction of roads, for instance, it almost seems like the engineers don't think about the drainage aspect of it. But what brought Nairobi especially to that point of every time it rains, we deal with water? And I was reading an article and they were talking about the issue of topography, history, drainage. There's so many things, planning hitches. But in your view, what brought us to that point? Because again, we'll have another rainy season and we'll go through the floods yeah. again. That, you mentioned history, there's a historical fact yeah. that um, when the railway came to the city of Nairobi, they found a green swampy area 
and established their headquarters there. And there was even, a, at one point, I think, a report from one of the engineers or people in charge of the city who mentioned this place may not be so su uh, suitable for capital city. That is now behind us. We can't do much about right. that. There are topogra topographical issues. Um, Nairobi is quite interesting because you, many people don't realize, but the railway line divides the city into two. It divides the city into a highland area and the beginning of the lowlands that take us to the, to the coast. And when you look at how the city was planned um, several years back, it was assumed that the drainage would come towards the railway line, which kind of may explain why Nairobi Dam is situated where it is, because that's where most of, most of the, the water would come would come towards and then it can easily drain in the in the national park right. but now other factors have come in um, more recently which is like you mentioned engineering poor engineering with some of our recent infrastructure projects we've seen very sad stories along thicker road mm. especially the parklands area where you know Ndoto road um, museum hill area where it just suddenly floods and that seems to be Yes, there's a topographical aspect, but there are engineering solutions to, towards um, some of the uh, problems like that. Then we have lowland areas like uh, Mbakasi, South Sea, where the, the, the engineering solution has to take into account that topography and take into account the fact that these areas will tend to accumulate uh, water more than before. But then there's all, there are also other factors that come in, like illegal constructions mm -hmm. that block riparian reserves. Right. There's a famous building near... Um, Langata Road that, that is known to have been built on top of a river. There's another shopping mall next to, not far from Westgate, that has also been known to be literally built on top of a river. Now, And those areas tend to flood when, when it rains. So those are now other issues of just almost Im what we can call impunity, mis uh, mismanagement, and can be avoided if, if, if we wanted to. And also, an another factor also that comes in is we've made an effort as Nairobians because of security reasons to wall all our, our compounds. I remember when I was growing up, most of our fences were actually K-Apple, and the water would, would simply go through. Now, when we've done this walling, have we taken into account the fact that now, and, and when we've done this densification and more concrete, we have less infiltration of water? That has to be taken into account when you're, as, as you're, you're developing the city. Right. I mean, it's important to remember that cities are not inorganic. A city is not like this table that will remain like this. Cities will change mm. because people are building, people are coming in, people are, people are being born, people are dying, um, new ideas come up. You know, now there's a hype with shopping malls. Tomorrow there'll be a hype with something else. Right. Um, new technologies come up. You know, 100 years ago we didn't have, 150 years ago we didn't have uh, light rail trains. We didn't have uh, urban cable cars within urban centers. We didn't even have bus rapid transit. Even cars were not there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, people are using horseback. Over time, things change. And, that, and the planning has to continue, continue changing. And, and we've, we've seen many interesting stories. Um, I think it's Curitiba that had flooding issues. And, and what they did was to, Curitiba is in Brazil, mm -hmm. just for those who may not know. Um, what they did was to create urban parks around some of the flooding areas such that during the rainy season, of course, people don't go to the parks, so the water would flood within those parks, okay, and then accumulate, then gets back to the river when the, the rain dries and then flows flows with the river. So those are some of the just innovative ideas, yeah. ways that I'm sure even we, we may even get more innovative ideas from some of our young Nairobians on, on how to solve some of these issues. Absolutely. Let's take a short break on that. Hold that thought constant remains with me as we continue this uh, discussion on urban planning in Nairobi and the way forward, the future. There's also uh, what they call the Nairobi Integrated Urban Development Master Plan. We'll be talking to Constant more about that, what it means and will it work. We're taking a short break here on NTV Today. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. You're watching NTV Today. I'm Victoria Rubadiri. Still continuing on with this discussion on uh, urban planning here in Nairobi. Constant Cap still with me. He is the uh, executive director of the Kimani Development uh, Project. Thanks for staying with me. And so many insights we were talking during the break. People have no idea these things exist. A lot of times they're very good at complaining on social media about what's not working, the drainage, the traffic, the garbage collection issue. Um, however, we don't speak to the 
likes of you uh, in terms of what can we do to deal with the situation. I wanted to head back to the whole issue of urban sprawl because a lot of people saying, especially experts, that it is a disaster in the making. Beyond the obvious that they are coming up so quickly without a proper plan, but what other issues could we for not foresee in the future if we don't deal with it now? First of all, of course, health issues come in, into consideration when you're talking about urban sprawl because you're talking about places that are essentially changing from rural land use yes. in, into sub-urban kind of you know, out, outskirts, urban, area, urban areas. And even the way the land is divided initially from maybe a ranch into smaller areas where smaller parcels where they start putting up um, flats uh, like we've seen in, in parts of Rongai and uh, Yurai or may, even Maisonets, mm -hmm. in, like places like Siokimau. You have issues, for instance, you don't have sewer systems in some of these places. Okay, You, you may have uh, a situation where the original landowner doesn't want to give enough road, road reserve because he wants to save, <laughs> he wants to make as much as he can from yeah. his subdivision. Right. Okay, that obviously now comes with congestion and environment issues. Um, again, because people want to maximize profits, you end up with very little uh, space allocated for green, for green areas. And then you end up with a lot of congested kind of uh, uh, build, uh, building. And then because these areas are not necessarily located in Nairobi, and with all due respect to those in development control of those other counties, but they, they may not have the expertise to oversee some, some of these developments. So we may actually end up with some of the unfortunate situations we've seen in Huruma happening in some of those areas. Okay. That may be one, one of the challenges. You know, I, I remember um, a friend of mine was, uh, did a research a few years ago f as part of his PhD, and he was looking at the, the strength of buildings within, within the city. Yeah. And, and I think he talked about up to 40% of the buildings could collapse under a very small kind of light tremor within the city. Now you can imagine those on the outskirts that have sprawled out and are not being over, overseen as the, um, and inspected as they are being, being constructed. Right. We should just be happy and touch wood that it has not happened yet right. and we pray that it will, it will not happen yet. Then of course you have now these other issues. All those people are not there because they are, they are working there. Many of those people are living there in those areas, those sprawling areas, but coming to work in, mm -hmm. within the city. And we've not provided efficient mass transit modes for them. So the, the ideal thing for them is try to get buy a, buy a car and come to the city. Of course, now we've seen the impact it had on places like Mombasa Road. We've seen the impact on, on, on Thika Road. We've seen the, the impact on Langata Road, where I, by, by 7 in the morning, these roads are, in fact, even by 6.30. Today, if you're coming from, taking a bus from Mombasa at night, the jam will start in Siokimau. Yeah, okay? yeah. And you won't get to Nairobi when they tell you, be there by 7, 7 a.m. anymore, you end up coming much later. Because this, and, and these are the effects of, of uh, poor land use management, yeah. uh, sprawling cities, and then lack of proper transit and mobility um, facilities being, being uh, implemented. There's been an attempt with the, by Kenya Railways to put the Siokimau rail, but again, that was more of a knee jerk reaction mm -hmm. to use an already existing rail and not to analyze the land use. So it, it had mixed mixed feeling. It's quite popular among quite a number of people, but for a, a rail transit, you'd expect it to be much, much more popular, many more people using it. But because it's not, it doesn't take into account maybe um, the fact that most people have done their settlements closer to Mombasa Road, you know, such, such kind of things, um, taking into account where people are settled, then you end up with that, with that situation where it's still more, more comfortable for someone to use his, his or her car to drive towards the city center be it maybe they're going across to Upper Hill, be it they're going to Westlands. Because now, as has happened, the business district areas of Nairobi have kind of transformed. Okay, And, and I was putting this on social media the other day that there's been so much transformation. If you look around the CBD, now we have many to let signs. Because all you look at it, all many of the big corporates have left now this, the right. central, what we used to call the central business district. They've moved to Upper Hill, they've moved to Kilimani. We've got lots of people coming there now. Um, they've moved to Westlands, quite a number of banks. Embassies moved because of security issues mm. after the unfortunate incident in 1998. And then, and also professional farms are kind of like moving out and we're ending up with a situation where we've got lots of potential within 
the CBD, but people are more comfortable moving on. And this, and this is, again, related to some of the other issues we've talked about. Okay? When you don't have good mobility within a city, mm -hmm. people are forced to use their cars, okay? and they come, you come to the CBD, either you have to pay for parking. Again, we have uh, urban economy issues. We've got, um, you come and find your side mirrors are gone. Or you find within the, the building that's been constructed doesn't have enough parking for all, all member, pe members of staff, so people are struggling to get there. So you end up with that kind of ripple effect. So people will say, okay, let's move to, say, Upper Hill, where we can have more parking for our staff. We can be away from that so-called congestion while trying to access. Unfortunately, we end up just taking those problems there. Okay, and sometimes now you see it, the KNH area getting quite congested, um, Arguin Scottek Road in the, in the evening, Valley Road getting quite quite congested because you've just taken a problem, you've transferred it. Yeah, to another location. To, to another location. Right. I mean, you've taken some other benefits to those areas, like people can set up restaurants for lunch and this <laughs> kind of other economic aspects. But now the main thing you're trying to solve, which was access, quality of, of, of life of people ends up not being solved. Right, right. Yeah. You mentioned also the parking issue, especially here in the CBD, which is quite a nightmare. And the deputy governor, before he resigned, uh, was speaking to my colleague Mark Masai and said, well, we have a plan to build parking garages across uh, around the CBD to at least deal with that. Yeah. Would that help, at least in terms of an immediate solution? The question I ask is, how long does it take to put up a parking garage? Yeah. If you want to put a 10-story parking garage, that's not something you'll do within a year. Um, it's not something it may take much more if you want quality uh, build, building construction. And if people are moving out, if these so people, ideal people who, are, who drive to work are moving out to the CBD, mm -hmm. is it really necessary to, to do that? Wouldn't you be m more interested in having simple access me means of ac accessing the CBD, um, even using the current strengths that we already have, like our bus services, transforming... Right. Um, our three, four main bus services in, into better, into providing us with a better service. You know, we've seen uh, an effort by, I think, it's City Shuttle to start using articulated buses. What if, wouldn't it be easier to ask investors who are coming into the bus, uh, the bus industry, now to move towards that, other than the, you know, the um, interesting shaped buses that we have where right. you have three chairs on one side and one, two seats and people have to squeeze in. Wouldn't it be more interesting to start making those kind of proactive changes and also showing those people how they can profit from it. And even, even give, and, and when you have articulated buses, you can now even start talking of designated bus lanes even without putting necessary infrastructure. You can just say, we're going to give the outer lane of Mombasa Road to people uh, fro, um, from coming from Mbakasi down uh, to South B area to the CBD. That's reserved for articulated buses. And bus camp, people will invest in it because it suddenly becomes much easier for people to move. Um, investors are happy because they, they can they can uh, put in their money into it, even people at local level. Right. And you've quickly, you've, you've got a quick gain. You've got a quick gain. And fine, people have, I know the, the, the deputy governor had talked about how um, Nairobi's population is too big to sustain uh, bus, bus transit, although I tend to oppose him on that because there are quite a number of cities um, we tend to, uh, that have successful uh, bus transit mm -hmm. systems that are uh, much uh, that have bigger metropolitan populations than ours. Right. And also taking into account that each channel, each transportation channel has its own challenges. Right. And therefore, when, you look, when we look at transportation, we have to ask ourselves, where are people coming from and where are they going? Absolutely. Okay. So we may be there putting parkings, but what we are doing, in fact, by doing that is encouraging more people to use cars. You build what you get for. Okay, interesting thoughts. They hold that uh, thought uh, constant. Let's cross over to Seth Olale, who is in the CBD, speaking to Nairobians about their thoughts on the implications of the fallout between Governor Sonko and his now uh, exited deputy, Polycap Igave. Seth. Thank you so much, Victoria. It's all about which way forward Nairobi County. I've been interacting with businessmen here in the CBD, border border operators who earlier on told me, you know what, they have been harassed by uh, county council carries over what they term is unfair, you know, what illegal licensing, because they say that uh, the prices, the fee has been hiked. But right now, I just want to engage Utombe Tuko Majinayako na tunazungumza tu kuhusu Nairobi County. Na kwa na kwa mba unafana kazi. Ebu tuwaleza kwa mba wei ni mfana kazi katika county ya Nairobi? Uh, mi ni mfana kazi katika kazi county ya Nairobi. Mm. Lakini mimi si county yenyewe. Mm. Mimi ni asa 
Uh, what? Contractor uh, to Sam. Contractor. Mm. So, kazi nyewe, mm. ni mzuri kazi si mbaya. Mm. Kupoetu wa medipea, medipea kazi, tunafanya lakini, kaundu naya, ayuduchali. Mm. Inapiti mkubwa, angoche pesa, apewe ndi atupatie. Chuu kama hacha apewe, atatupaya nini. Ebu choleze, uwa unafanya kazi yako kwa muda gani, nani kila siku kusababu kumekua pena titesi kwamba county ni chafu. Kuna uchafu barabarani na hii ni Nairobi, eh, county kuu. Ebu choleze kuhusu kazi yako kama wewe umeajiliwa na county government. Uu ufanya kazi masamangapi kwa siku? Mi ufanya kazi masamanane. Alafu, sisi wenyewe watu wakufakia atuna shida. Watu wa kupepa, mali tunatupanga takataka, unachua sisi atuwezi pepa takataka paka tondora. Sisi kasi yetu naesa kusema tunafanya mzuri sana. Si hata wewe ukiangalia, ni safi. Lakini kwenye tunamwaka hata ukienda hapa city market, ni chafu, hakuna lori. Sasa sisi ndio tukana shita ama watu wa, wa kupepa. Muko na vifaa vya kufanya kazi, vifaa. Naona kama kuna wheelbarrow, kuna kijiko, kuna, kijiko, kuna, kuna kifagio na kuna gloves vile vile. Kuna mask, mbali na hayo, uh, kuna vifa vingine ambavyo labda mnaona ni kama wafanikazi wa county mnalemewa na kuna sababisha kwamba kuna kuwa natikataka barabarani ama katika mita ya Nairobi. Sasa, for example, like uh, kamban, uh, tunalemewe, juu sasa sunaona ni kona kambut, siwezi kanyaka uchafu. Ndiyo unaona tunafakia kila mali, tunatoa takataka paka kwa malita pini, hakuna takataka. Na sasa tukifika mali pa kumuaka, ndiyo kuna nashita, ndiyo inafanya kaundi na kuwa chafu. Tunaye sisi atuwezi pepa takataka paka tondora, paka lori pepe. Na sasa hiyo kaundi ya Nairobi, kama tuseme uko city hall, ndiyo unafaa wa wajale na hiyo, wa, wajale na hiyo takataka, wanafaa waleta malori pepe. Sasa naulisa swali. Sisi wakufagia ndiyo tukwa na shita ama wale wakupepa takataka. Chuu sisi tunafagia. Tunafanya kasi yetu tarali. Hata ukiangalia sunaona hii mangara. Asante sana, asante sana. Na unafana kazi mzuri, endelea hivyo hivyo. Nda kuache wendelea na kazi yako. Kwa sababu unatuka na I am interacting with you know, various stakeholders as far as Nairobi County is concerned. And I want to talk to this gentleman over here who I called on earlier before. Mze tuambe tu kwa majina wa itu wa nani? Unaitua Peter Mtuwa Mwei. Peter Mtuwa Mwei, muna kwa ma county ya government ya Nairobi. Kwa national service. Naam, tunonga kuhusu county barabara. Mina uriza mwesimu wa songo. Ile minister wa, wa road wa onge mzuri. Ugiangia, ugiangia maroda about yote, haina marking. Na ma, road, road signs, hakuna. Mwa sasa. So, eh, kila kitu ingini, mimi sujini kitu kani kitampanjika kapa na kwa sababu, unakuta pale kwa hii maroda about. Aro inasema anda kushoto. Ngani anda street. Na asikari wako. Kwa nini umudu anda street? Haya, ingini anda, anasema anda right, anaenda street. Sasa nakuta kule mbele zinaenda kutana wabi, alabu kiungana jiwa nasikia kila mutu ate umu, kwa kujisu ini inu. Ile kitu ningeomba, ni barabara siwe kwa marking. Barabara iko vitu tatu. Iko road, mark, iko road signs, iko road marking, na iko shape. Hile barabara imeondwa. Tuwekeo hizo vitu, mine driver, ambaye wakati yonu likuwa instructor. Na niliona mashida mingi sana. Ya pili, hii masure, Inatakana mtu wakitoka kwa, kwa driving school, hawa wanajua kushora barabara vile inakaa, bila kuyona. Naam, naam. Na nikuliza tu kuhusu labda, saizi katika county government, sumamizu wa county government, ni kama kuna tetesi, tulioza kwamba naibu wa governor wa county wa Nairobi aliweza kujiuzulu, unafikiri hui na changia labda kusukue na suluhi. Kwa sababu, mtu wananaga na laini yake. Laini yangu ni ya kuendesha pangari, na kusumbuka kwa barabara. Barabara ziweko, eh, angalia hii binyara, hakuna, hakuna road marking, angalia hile nyao stadium, hakuna road marking, enda hile ngini ambele. Aya, tena, kwa nini watu wanapaka langi, awana experience ya kutosha, kama ni, ni, ni road marking, inatakani wako distant to distant, ndiyo kia approach hiyo road about wana yu wana yu wana yu wana Asante sana, asante sana, bila shaka na tabiri kwamba wasimamizi wa county ya Nairobi wameza kusikia. And I just want to engage one more person and I can see you are a security guard. Tuwambe tu jinako, what's your name sir? Jina langu ni Calvin Lovosi, mimi ndiyo security hapa. Tuweleza kwanza wei ni wasema ni security, hali ya usalama katikati mwajiji, CBD, hali ya usalama yuko vipi? Hali ya usalama ni ngumu sana, lelazima mwanainchi ni kujitolea. 
ile kitu naona tu kwa hii mji wa Nairobi lazima kila mtu tukue kitu kimoja kwa sababu hii ya usalama ni ngumu unaweza kuta mtu, mtu tu anaweza kuta maybe umeibiwa kirasmi na uwezi jua anapoingia ndani ya building unaweza dhani ni customer kumbe sio customer kwa hivyo nasema county na fai yake vile vifaa tunaita CCTV eh wana style kuweka CCTV na usalama ikuwa ya kutosha jambo la street uh, street boys ama street girls katika uh, mita ya uh, Nairobi umeweza kuwaona wamepungua ama bado ni wengi street boys hawa street boys ile kitu tunataka tu, tuone kwamba hii hawa street boys wana style kuweka mahali fulani instead ya kuranda randa wakisumbua maybe wa customers wakisumbua watu ile kitu tunataka tu at least waweze kuwaweka mahali pamoja maybe kama ni biashara waweke mahali pamoja wako wanafanya kazi zao at least hiyo itawasaidia ita maisha yao way forward ungetaka uhudumiwe vipi kama wewe mfanikazi na vile vile uh, wewe ni mkaaji wa Nairobi County ungetaka utumikiwe vipi mimi ile kitu nataka tu kitu ya kwanza hii mji wetu wa Nairobi kitu ya kwanza ina staili tuwe na usalama hiyo ni kitu ya kwanza sana and then kitu ya pili maisha imepanda juu wananchi saizi tunalia na ile wakati wa viongozi walipata kiti wakaidi wa Kenya au ma wakaidi au wa, au wa, wa muji wakasema vyakula zitarudi chini sasa ile kitu tunahitaji sana Ma, gharama ya, ya maisha imepanda juu tunataka viongozi viongozi wetu wa Kenya wakaweze ku Jungu, kuzungumzia hiyo jambo sana. Asante, asante sana. And I just here in the CBD actually Mwindu Mbingu Street where I just engage Nairobi residents in regards to the governance of this county and just to let you know just some moments ago behind me we had an operation uh, being led by inspectors of the Nairobi County government and we saw several cars being clamped and also earlier on we had taxi drivers complaining about the clamping they say they have duly paid uh, the parking fee but still there is harassment from the Nairobi County Ascaris and that is a story of course we'll be following up but right now I want to hand you over back uh, to Victoria in studio. All right, thanks, Seth, for that. Great to hear from the people who clean our streets and also protect our businesses in the CBD on the Nairobi they want. Uh, perfect segue into the last part of our discussion when it comes to Nairobi and urban planning. The current master plan that is in place, it's known as the Nairobi Integrated Urban Development Master Plan. It was launched in 2013. Uh, the envisioned timeline is the next 17 years they expect to turn it into a smart city. Constant Cap still with me. He's the executive director of the Kilimani uh, Project Foundation. And I wanted to get your take on this. Uh, a very ambitious plan, about 300 million shillings that they've put into it. Um, and of course, Nairobians wondering, when will we actually see this come into fruition? Uh, but just take us through more of this plan. Yeah, the, the plan provides a good framework for urban development. Yeah. But there still has to be more spatial, spatial planning within districts, within neighborhoods, based on what, what, what the plan uh, bring, brings about. It was developed uh, in conjunction with, with, with uh, by the Nairobi City Council in conjunction with, with, with JICA. And one of, among its strengths include that fact that it does provide a good framework based on what the city is and, and some of the challenges the city faces. Right. Um, it's very strong on data, co data collection. I mean, you can actually get you know, aspects on transit, aspects on land use um, on, within the plan. And there was a good effort towards involving communities um, to, be, to be part of it though not maybe as good as it could have been because still when you ask people i mean they, they show you the data that we had meetings here meetings there um though when you ask people they still say no but i never i never heard about it i only had it when it was done and, and and such and even access to it is not that as easy they say you can go and get it on their website but you still have to struggle when you go there to to get it there are a number of areas that um i i I may find it to be a bit a bit weak on. Mm. For instance, it tends to be inclined towards being more central based, other than uh, community trying to build up urban development through building up communities. There's a lot more that that can be done on that, and it does not explain how to integrate what we have now onto what it, it wants to envision. 
And this is a very big, big, big challenge, especially when it comes to human settlements, right. when it comes to transit and mobility, when it comes to urban economy. Because we have a very big, say, informal economy, mm. but it does not show how it's going to integrate that into what it, it, it in, 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 intends to achieve. And then you end up wondering whether some of these so-called projects will just be kind of, again, as we had talked earlier, top bottom um, implemented projects. Right. That integration process, there's always, there's still room to do a lot of that from, by us, by the general Nairobi society, but that's an area that needs to be kind of, kind of re-looked re, re, re into. And of course, any plan can, can be good on paper, but yep. there has to be also political will to implement it. There has to be political will from those at, at City Hall, from those in the county assembly, from uh, even from uh, us, the community organizations and the residents. If there's no political will towards implementing planning, then it, it, it just doesn't happen. Okay, great place to leave it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Constant, for your time, your insights. And yes, Nairobians will be watching closely on this master plan. Thank you so yeah. much for coming in. Thank you.